Well, hello everyone. This is Data Driven Formula One with Patrick Hansen Gana Pagrabna. Hi, Patrick. Hello, Gana. Hello, we, all. We have a very interesting character today to talk yes. about um, Mario Andretti. Mario uh, Andretti. Right. What a character. Because, okay, he has two very cool features that we will discuss in detail today. First of all, I don't think we have ever discussed a Formula One driver who was a refugee before. And yep. Mario Andretti was a refugee. And there is currently mm -hmm. a lot of discussions about refugees considering recent, uh, you know, uh, military conflicts and wars that we have going on. Um, and uh, there is constantly this uh, talk about whether refugees are bringing anything to the economy and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, here's an example of a person who was a refugee and was a mm -hmm. very, 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 very successful Formula One driver and also IndyCar driver, right? Yeah, so, and uh, various other uh, series. And various other series, so that's right. And um, also, uh, we have never had a, a driver uh, before uh, in, in the series that has a twin brother. So yeah. Mario Andretti has a twin brother, had, had a twin brother. Uh, so Mario Andretti is uh, still with us. Uh, he is 82, but uh, his brother Aldo passed away uh, two years ago when he was 80. And, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, so there you go already. Two facts for you, <laughs> former refugee, and uh, he had a twin brother. And uh, exactly, you know, we, we will actually discuss uh, uh, the character and the life and career of Mario Andretti in detail, but uh, yes. here are two facts that you can already start thinking about. Right, and he's uh, still very active, uh, even uh, related to Formula One, and he's also uh, active on uh, social media. You can uh, follow him, for example, on uh, Twitter. I don't know if he's also on Instagram. Uh, I Maybe he's yes. on TikTok. <laughs> We'll I see. don't know. I, I, I'm not on TikTok myself. <laughs> so maybe you can look for him. Well, he definitely has a website that we will show you at the end. Uh, yes. So I guess. And uh, he's if you, definitely on Twitter. Yeah. So if you are interested in you know other places where you can find Mario Andretti, or uh, as a matter of fact, Andretti's family, Andretti family, mm -hmm. uh, you can look um, uh, on his website and uh, you will get, I'm sure, um, a variety of options to connect. With Mario yes. Okay, so here you see uh, the person again. Uh, uh, you, we do this video podcasts on YouTube and Spotify. Uh, if you have just found us uh, as an audio podcast, uh, check out these locations. If you have the opportunity to also watch uh, a screen, because we show you a lot of uh, photos uh, to underline a little bit the things we are discussing. Okay, uh, brief profile, full name Mario Gabriele Andretti. He's an Italian uh, born American, and uh, yes, he's Italian born, and we will explain this a little bit uh, directly in, in, on the next uh, page. He's one of the most successful Americans in the history of motorsports. I'm just thinking, as for me, he's not one of the most, he is the most successful American. He's practically one everything so i don't see any american and if you speak about american sorry no, no, I don't... Uh, yeah in indianapolis yes. uh, we have uh, of course aj foyt, foyt yeah. who i think uh, surpasses uh, uh, in indianapolis but uh, you know uh, so if we if we're talking about uh, uh, sort of um, kind of american racing then definitely aj foyt i think is kind of has a more substantial number of wins, but uh, that doesn't mean that, <laughs> that uh, Mario Andretti is less successful. Uh, yeah, I think just, uh, just by count, yeah. Uh, yeah, but, uh, uh, but if you consider that Mario Andretti won uh, Formula 1, Indica, mm -hmm. and a lot of other championship, I mean... For, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely on heterogeneity of I mean, also, yeah. if, you, if you also, if you consider his impact on the pop uh, culture, uh, I mean, if you think uh, of American then it would be Mario. Uh, under the end, uh, 
And also, uh, before somebody uh, comments us, uh, American uh, would be here related to uh, US American, because of course, also Mexican, Brazilian, Argentinians are uh, American. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, during his career, Andretti won the 1978 uh, Formula One championship with the uh, famous uh, Lotto, uh, ground, Lotus uh, ground effect car. He came back for a very last race in 1982. Sorry, with for two races at the end of the 82 season uh, due to the uh, accidents at the Ferrari team. Date of birth, uh, 28th of February, 1940. Place of birth is Montana, sorry, uh, Montona in the Kingdom of uh, Italy. So a part of Italy at that time, which is not part of Italy today. And we'll come back to this. He wrote... Uh, had been at various teams, Lotus, March, Ferrari, the uh, US Panelli team, uh, Alfa Romeo, and also uh, Williams. 131 entries, 12 victories, and uh, one championship. That's right. And Only uh, he... speaking about his Formula One statistics. Yeah, and uh, he currently owns a, a racing team as well that we will talk about and uh, yep. tell you quite a lot towards the end about it. Exactly. All and, right. Uh, so let's start from the beginning. Right. And this is exactly what uh, Ghana uh, mentioned. Uh, he was uh, born, um, well, of course, together with his br uh, twin brother and uh, 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 the rest of the family. Uh, his father has been Alvis uh, Andretti, a farm administrator, and his wife, uh, Rina. And this in Montona, Istria, which had been part of the Kingdom of Italy, uh, but after uh, Second World uh, War, had been, uh, well, had been, sorry, still is a part of uh, Croatia. And uh, due to this uh, uh, fact that it became part of uh, Yugoslavia at that time, so it's not directly Italy to Croatia, but uh, after Second World War, uh, Yugoslavia was uh, formed where Croatia was a part of and which is now an independent uh, country. So uh, as uh, Croatian people, for obvious reason, uh, not really uh, had been that fond of uh, Italians at that time, they had uh, uh, to leave and go to uh, Italy, where they lived uh, in a camp for refugees based uh, on the Treaty of the Paris and Treaty uh, Agreement. And this was uh, in 1948, where they left uh, as practically all Italians and went to Luca in Italy. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And um, yeah, again, kind of um, you can anticipate that that was not the only move for the family because uh, he ended up eventually in the U.S., um, but definitely this was uh, a big, uh, big shock for the whole family. And, um, you know, you can only, you know, you can only start to imagine what happens. I mean, uh, I come from a, a part of the country that was annexed by another country. So I can tell you that it's not fun when that happens. So I completely understand the, the, the feelings. And uh, we have a really a cool quote for you that that Patrick found from um, from uh, Mario Andretti, who was explaining what exactly was happening when uh, when they moved and uh, they essentially had to leave everything behind, like their, all their lives behind when they moved to Italy. Exactly. So for the reason you are uh, for the uh, if you are on the audio podcast, uh, let me read it to you. My father left everything behind. We left our home and took what we could carry and went further into Italy. They had to swallow all of these families that were dispersed and they formed all different camps over Italy and we were shipped to a place in Tuscany. So this was the background for the case that, uh, for example, uh, you visit uh, Croatia. It's uh, a very beautiful uh, little town, Motovun, uh, as now called in local language. Uh, you can even see now uh, the house where the um, Andretti family lived. If you're watching so, us on YouTube or Spotify, uh, 
yeah. if you are connecting to us on other platforms uh, yeah we we exist in uh, in the podcast forum but uh, we have a video version where we show you a little bit of you know um, visual material Again, we are uh, doing this ethically. We only show material that we have license to, to show or um, we uh, we can show on CC BY license. So essentially, and we, we want to obviously promote the ethical way of uh, using information. So please uh, go to sources that actually have copyright to show, uh, to show material and uh, you know this is this is very important and uh, obviously we always welcome you to follow uh, our uh, youtube channel uh, and uh, press on the uh, on the bell so that you are notified when we are releasing new episodes that's right yeah uh, early, early life, life. Uh, andre mario and uh, alvar's um, father uh, stayed in contact with a fam family which already immigrated into the United States. Uh, as uh, you all know, uh, after World War II, even before a lot of uh, Europeans immigrated uh, to North America, uh, as also uh, to uh, South America, for example. So especially a lot of Italians, as you know, from various Hollywood movies, and of course, based uh, on maybe on your personal uh, family history experience, uh, immigrated uh, to the US. And this was also the case for the Andretti family. So uh, Mario Andretti's family had uh, connections to the US. And as they had been as refugees in Italy, so they not had been a, an established place uh, there, of course, it wasn't uh, a, such a big decision to leave also Italy again to uh, start uh, completely new in a different country, which they considered should be the United States, which also at that time had been actively uh, looking uh, for a workforce from other places. Mm -hmm. uh, so and, uh, originally... Yeah, yeah, I just want to say that originally they thought that they were going there temporarily. But yeah. uh, nothing uh, is more more permanent than the temporary <laughs> temporary plan. Um, yeah. uh, so they actually remained in the US. Uh, it, it was very difficult for them <coughs> to obtain visas. It took uh, three years to, to do that. Uh, it's very yeah. difficult, obviously, because of the refugee st status. Uh, so it was kind of obvious to American authorities that they probably didn't have many ties to, <laughs> to, to Italy and they couldn't come back home. So, um, but eventually they made it, and uh, you know, as as we yeah. as we know, they remained in the U.S. Yeah, but uh, not that directly. They went to the U.S. after five years, returned to Italy, and then uh, for the final time went, went to back, uh, went back to the yeah. U.S. Yeah. Also, here uh, from Mario Andretti's uh, memoirs, uh, a quote. When I looked at my life in many ways out of so many negatives, here comes a positive, and this was certainly one of them. Here was an opportunity, speaking about uh, the US, created for us. Uh, the kids and my dad always cited that. He would say, in a sense, I'm looking at your future when I think uh, would be the best solution for you kids to have opportunities. And he was correct. He was right, because uh, if we had remained in Italy, I don't uh, know whether I would have pursued what my first passion was and the only passion I really had uh, career-wise and uh, speaking about uh, racing. Uh, and he, I mean, he practically uh, cites uh, the uh, typical um, American uh, dream. So he's right, he would, would know, who knows what have happened uh, if he stayed in Italy. Even uh, to be fair, uh, we have to see similar to Germany, also, uh, Italy uh, got uh, had, had been included, for example, in the uh, Marshall Plan. So there was quite a positive uh, economic development in Italy after World War II, as we saw also in the rest of the country. But of course, USA was a very good option for the Andretti's. Yes, and uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, you also can see the picture of Mario Andretti versus his brother Aldo. 
And we will look at some more pictures of uh, the yeah. two brothers. Yeah, luckily from, you found a lot from, of nice... Uh, from very early age. Uh, so that's obviously prior to, uh, to the move to Italy. Uh, yeah. So this is actually in their kind of natural, <laughs> natural habitat of the family, of the Andretti family. Uh, and uh, this is already when they, you know, were kind of forced to go to, uh, to, to move and, um, yeah. you know, ended up in the refugee camp and um, eventually went to the US. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, they, they look uh, both uh, very uh, positive uh, in the food, foods as very optimistic uh, people uh, to the same character as uh, we see with Mario Andretti uh, still today. Yeah, and well, you know, children are a lot more adaptable, I guess, to these types yeah. of situations uh, in general. Yeah, so, and these are already when they're older, and uh, you can't really see what is uh, kind of uh, next to them on the screen, but that's actually a racing car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when I, when I put this picture up, I noticed that it was kind of cut off a little bit, but it is a racing car. Um, right. And again, the two brothers are there. And uh, yeah. I really like this this picture. So the, there are kind of quite a few people there, but the guy who is looking in into the camera, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, is Aldo Andretti, and Mario is kind of looking at him, and he's also in the blue short. Uh, but I um, mean, this uh, this whole sort of picture reminds me if you've watched uh, West Side Story, in the, you know the musical. So this is kind of. Uh, very similar <laughs> in spirit of course uh, you know so like uh, in terms of uh, sort of the the um the, the time the, the the time timeline and sort of the the style of uh, the haircuts and everything yeah, else yeah that's right uh, and, and also i mean uh, rem, rem, the, for our younger viewers uh, you have to consider that uh, taking photos in that time you take a photo uh, and when the film is full after 24 36 photos you bring it uh, to a shop to develop it so it's not like today where you check that uh, everybody really smiled uh, into the camera so sometimes you're lucky uh, the people smiled, sometimes people looked to the left, to the right, but you only detect this uh, like weeks after. Yeah, and uh, the whole picture is in, uh, also in front of the car, if you notice. So they're definitely yeah. doing some work on the car. Exactly. And uh, this is already in older age. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, if you... If you don't know which one is Aldo and which one is Mario, we can actually we can actually tell you. <laughs> but maybe put some comments under the video just to tell us what you think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at, in general, it should be possible because they have not been identical twins. Yes, they look yes. very very similar, but they are not identical. Yeah, we bet you can tell the difference, but tell us. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, let's talk about early career. Yeah. And, uh... So we are back uh, to the time when both of them had been uh, five years old and they already have been influenced uh, by the virus of uh, cars, motorsports. So they raised handcrafted wooden cars outside in the streets. Later, uh, as the family, as uh, refugees, uh, needed the money, so they started uh, working uh, very early age uh, in uh, valid parking. So I would assume this was then when they've been in the US, uh, because I'm not sure if valid parking existed at that time in Italy. As it's not really known, for example, in Europe, uh, valid parking means if you're going to a restaurant, for example, you don't park your car uh, yourself, uh, but give it uh, to the person uh, to the who stands yeah. there. You give them the keys and they put the car for you on the parking spot, which could be directly besides the restaurant or it could be like one minute uh, driving distance. Something which is very common in, in the US, but not really known in, in Europe, for example. 
Another, another quote by Mario, the first time I fired up a car, felt the engine shudder and the wheel come to life in my hands, I was hooked. It was a feeling I can't describe. I still get it every time I get into a race car. Mm -hmm. So Andretti, um, Mario's, uh, Andretti's first racing appearance uh, has been uh, at the New Jews racing lead uh, called Formula Junior in Ancona. So I assume this was in a time uh, the, after they returned uh, from um, the US uh, because he was now 13 years old. And uh, for example, he also had been as a spectator uh, at the uh, Mille Miglia and his big uh, idol had been Alberto Ascari, who also became a Formula One champion in 1952-53. If you're interested, we did a special episode about Alberto Ascari. Uh, I think uh, a great photo to really uh, imagine how, how big uh, the Mille Miglia was in Italy at that time. You see here the three cars uh, surrounded uh, by by the fans, and these red cars are not are no Ferraris. These are uh, Lancia C twenty four. Again, he said, "I don't remember as a kid wanting to do or be anything else but to drive something, be a race driver." So he really, since early on, he had this virus to say that way uh, inside him. Exactly. And uh, later we will also um, uh, read the quote, uh, and I just remember it when he also said that I, I never had a plan B, so like I wanted to be the driver and I just didn't have any other, any basically any other ambition. So um, Exactly. I mean, in general, this is a bad thing uh, because not for everybody plan A works out, so you always should have plan B, C, D, but he didn't, and for him, it worked out perfectly. Mm, but uh, you, he kind of did, because you know there are so many different types of racing you could participate yeah. in, right? So, yeah, Formula One, is, of course, is a highly, highly selective, but yeah. at the same time, you know, there are, there are many options. Um, exactly, and I mean, he, uh, we discussed it also, uh, he really, not really... A when uh, focused on Formula One, I mean, he nearly, uh, I mean, maybe one of the reasons why he not uh, had been more success in Formula One had been because he not really had his priority here, but his priority many times stayed uh, with racing inside the US. Yeah, so he diversified within racing. <laughs> Correct. Okay, let's uh, go a little bit uh, back uh, to his uh, family uh, history. In 1955, and now the Andretti family finally immigrated to the United States of America, settling in uh, Nazareth, Pennsylvania, with just 125 US dollar to the name. Of course, this was much more than today, but still not much. Pennsylvania, uh, this was uh, uh, the this area was uh, practically dominated by the steel industry, an industry uh, which in that form is not um, existing uh, anymore. I had the luck uh, to travel. Unfortunately, I hadn't been to Nazareth uh, itself. You see on the right a photo of Nazareth. Uh, but I had been to Bethlehem, which is very near and the the town is think it's a quite a similar uh, place. Uh, Bethlehem was uh, the place where practically everybody worked at uh, Bethlehem Steel, which is now practically a, an open air museum, a place uh, also to meet where there are, for example, concerts, where we have uh, food trucks. So uh, like a park where people uh, now like to meet, and uh, quite funny in uh, Bethlehem uh, is also one, it's practically, no, sorry, it's uh, the only place where I saw uh, still today uh, McDonald's in the original design. As for example, if you saw the famous movie, The Founder, about the uh, McDonald's history, if you not saw uh, this very highly recommended, it's not a McDonald's advertising movie, uh, but it really shows uh, the history of this company. So really, don't be afraid. It's not a McDonald's advertising. It's 
does not show McDonald's always in the brightest light, but really fun uh, to watch. And there you see how the originally designed uh, McDonald's restaurants have been created inside and outside. And one of the last one uh, you see here in Bethlehem, a city which still, uh, uh, you may say time have forgotten a little bit. So you see the old spirit of 1950s, 1960s uh, steel area, which I, is similar to Nazareth where the Andretti's moved to. Okay, uh, coming uh, back to uh, the Andretti's, at the end of the 1950s, uh, he finished uh, high school and Mario planned to become a welder. And so he wanted to work directly in the steel industry because it was practically where everybody in this area was uh, working at and where you could uh, earn money, especially if you not uh, have a high school uh, education or, where you have, or when you have been an immigrant uh, to the country. Uh, he falsified uh, a driver license uh, to pass for 21 and yeah, enter amateur as, racing. Uh, as, as yeah. This is a popular strategy for many teenagers <laughs> in the US. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> At least you, you see it in, in, all, uh, in all the movies. <laughs> yeah, well, not only in the movies, but um, yeah. in practice as well. Um, yeah. And certainly, well, you know, he wanted to, because he wanted to enter the race and, uh, you know, it was only for adults and obviously, you know, that yeah. was sort of, that was his excuse to, to do Yeah, it. I mean, mostly a teenager uh, do it uh, to get uh, alcohol. Alcohol, uh, you have yeah. to consider, <laughs> uh, here in the US, uh, you are legally allowed to drink alcohol only with uh, 21, not like 18 or even 16 for beer, uh, as for example, in Europe. So... That's why uh, uh, this uh, focus on falsifying the paper. That's right. Um, but, um, you know, the, eventually he became a citizen in 1964 yeah. and then he could legally participate <laughs> in, in, different, in different races. And uh, certainly he did quite a few road courses, uh, course races uh, in the US and that's how he got, got into competitive driving. Yeah, uh, which is uh, rather untypical uh, uh, if you want to end up in Formula One, for example, uh, to, uh, to uh, race stock uh, cars on road courses because it's something completely different. Uh, so it's not a typical karting way. It's not going via motorcycle racing, but uh, stock car racing. Yeah, and uh, again, we just want to emphasize that this wasn't a kid from a rich family. It was a refugee exactly. and, uh, <laughs> you know, really cool. Uh, um, yeah, if you if you think about it, uh, this is a really cool career to go from sort of uh, road course racing into Formula One eventually. Exactly. And, um... And uh, one of the reasons why we put the photos is that you get a little bit idea. We are speaking here about the steel belt, about the blue color uh, area. So uh, here people dreamt of stock car racing. I mean, uh, thinking about something like uh, costly, elegant as Formula One or even Indy uh, car wasn't really uh, in scope, really realistically speaking. But nevertheless, a uh, uh, young uh, Mario went uh, into IndyCar and he became the youngest national champion uh, with the age of 25, which is uh, rather old if you consider today's uh, Formula One, uh, for example. And he repeated a series uh, of championship uh, also in 1966. He won nine races in 69, the 1969 Indianapolis 500, and also the season uh, championship. So uh, also he participated in uh, Formula 5000, uh, which is something like uh, mix up something similar to Formula One, but often driven with older cars, uh, for example. If you see the photo on the right, uh, uh, his 69 IndyCar, uh, uh, quite interesting design reminds me a little bit uh, to the Lotus, uh, for example. Yeah, uh, quite nice uh, car from my point of view. 
Yeah, I think it looks uh, very much like uh, obviously uh, uh, typical American make cars uh, because yeah. obviously it's uh, better on a straight, uh, you know, straight lines. Uh, and uh, but yeah, very cute. Yeah, cute. very cute, uh, very slim, uh, small aerodynamic uh, car. Mm -hmm. So, but he didn't stay only in IndyCar, stock car. In uh, Formula 5000, also he became uh, successful in uh, sports car uh, racing. For example, 1965, he started uh, with a Ferrari 275P at the 500 kilometer at the Bridgehampton uh, race circuit, even though he not finished. Uh, then later he won uh, the famous 12 hours uh, of Sebring, 1967, 97, 1972, the 24 hours of Daytona in the same year, 72. And uh, so really he also very successful in a complete different kind of racing. Mm -hmm. You see, he's really an, an uh, all around uh, talents having championships in complete uh, different uh, championships. Yeah, exactly. So very heterogeneous uh, events. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, he was very, very good in this endurance races. Exactly. And uh, here uh, he also he started his connection uh, to Ferrari. Uh, I mean, somehow logically, if you have an uh, Italian uh, legacy, Besides this, also a logical choice because these cars had been dominating at that time. Yeah. Yeah. So finally, we are speaking also about Formula One. Yeah, and uh, the the um, faithful um, uh, meeting uh, between uh, or uh, sort of the first first meeting. Uh, between Colin Chapman, who was, a, as we know, a Lotus principal, and um, uh, uh, Mario Andretti happened in 1965 during the Annapolis 500. And uh, yeah. from that point on, his life was never the same <laughs> because he, <laughs> he actually, you know, became, uh, yeah, so he, he uh, uh, became a Formula One driver. Exactly. Uh, due to the legend, uh, Colin Chapman told him, uh, call me when you feel uh, ready for Formula One and I have a car for you. Three years later, uh, Mario felt uh, ready, called uh, Colin Chapman and uh, got the car. Mm -hmm. uh, important, and we discussed it a little bit, uh, over the next four years, he never drove uh, a whole uh, championship, but only sporadically as... Uh, his uh, priority number one and maybe also his contracts uh, uh, meant that he would uh, drive uh, Indianapolis. So only if there was a free weekend, he uh, could uh, drive in Formula One. As for example, in 1971, in the beginning, he drove this uh, beautiful Ferrari uh, 312B. Uh, uh, that's right. And um, I just wanted also to say that uh... Um, yeah, so um, it uh, so it's probably a good thing that he didn't drive for Lotus at that time because we know that the car was not really was a very fast car, but not very reliable cars and very dangerous. Yeah, uh, because it kind of was uh, uh, made based on this whole eggshell principle, uh, and um, as a result, we had quite a few fatalities in Lotus uh, yeah. with Lotus drivers. So it's probably quite lucky for him not to be involved in sort of constant driving of a Lotus car. Yeah, I think he also said this a little bit uh, mm -hmm. later. So now first uh, real complete Formula One season for the uh, American uh, Panelli team, I would uh, assume uh, that the owners had uh, Italian uh, heritage based uh, on the name. Uh, small team coming from uh, the mentioned uh, Formula 5000 and also I think in IndyCar they had been active and so then they decided we made it there, uh, let's go to Formula 1. First year was quite uh, uh, okay, but as we see uh, sometimes when smaller teams are entering, 
they have uh, maybe they have good ideas. They have some very good key uh, employees. So the first year is going very good. Then uh, the next year, uh, based on limited budget, uh, uh, limited possibilities to develop, maybe key employees go to the bigger teams. Uh, they start uh, struggling and the same uh, happened to uh, Panelli, meaning they had to uh, uh, leave Formula One somewhere in the middle of 1976. And, uh, and uh, Mario Andretti still had a good contact um, to Colin Chapman. So as uh, and, uh, Panelli left the sport practically the same day, he called Colin Chapman and still switched to Lotus the very same uh, year and stayed there also for the next years. End of uh, 1970s, uh, Colin Chapman uh, started uh, airplane engineering and he, uh, Colin Chapman was the owner of Lotus and also an uh, engineer himself. So he has had the idea, the vision to use air, um, airplane engineering to make Formula One cars uh, faster. So yeah. he practiced, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, when we discussed Colin Chapman in a, in a special episode, we also were talking a lot about how he could really spot talent. And uh, this is why probably when Mario Andretti called him, you know, he couldn't obviously couldn't resist and he knew good driver right away and a great talent right away. And uh, that's why I was kind of such a lucky, uh, uh, such, such a lucky spot for... Mario Andretti to be, and eventually exactly. it paid off. <laughs> exactly, Lotus had very talented drivers all the time uh, until uh, at the end Ayrton Senna. Even if uh, the Lotus team in the eighties didn't had that much uh, relation anymore to the times we are speaking about, um, so seventy eight uh, he used what we call the Winka where Colin Chapman already included uh, these ideas of aerodynamics, very fast, unfortunately not reliable due to this, no uh, possibility for Andretti to fight for the championship. Then 1978, uh, the Lotus 79, even more extreme and included uh, the ground effect uh, technology. Basically speaking, it's a reverse uh, airplane wing. So at uh, high speeds, uh, the airplane not going uh, the, into the air, but at higher speeds, the car stays even closer on the track, and which makes it uh, faster, not that only in accelerating, but also uh, going around uh, curves. This helps a lot. So that's why after 1978, everybody else copied this idea from Lotus until finally this technology was forbidden after 82 because it was quite uh, dangerous. Because if you're losing the contact with the track, as for example, you are a little bit too fast uh, in a curve, you are in the grass, then abruptly the car loses uh, this contact and very fast and unpredictable uh, goes off. 78 was the big year for Michael Andretti winning the championship, which uh, unfortunately, he couldn't really enjoy because uh, he won uh, the title officially in Monza in the very same race where his direct uh, colleague, uh, Ronnie Peterson, the second uh, driver at Lotus, had the fatal accident. Um, if you remember, maybe from seeing the race or from our episode, uh, it was a big accident in the beginning of the race. And first of all, it wasn't really uh, identified that there was a risk for Ronnie Peterson to not survive the night. But this was so, uh, uh, Mario Andretti practically celebrated uh, his victory after the race uh, and uh, learned about uh, Ronnie Peterson's death, if I'm correct, uh, while driving in the, uh, listening to the radio in the car. Uh, of course, so a very bittersweet championship for Mario Andretti.
He stayed uh, with the team, but uh, everybody else copied the ground effect technology. Unfortunately, a technology easy to copy. So um, Lotus didn't have this advantage. Uh, and uh, even more, they didn't have a competitive uh, car anymore. So even if the car still looks nice, green, not very uh, successful, so really uh, no way to fight for, for championship or even uh, victories. Also then, uh, maybe also supported by his Italian uh, heritage, he switched to Alfa Romeo, who at that time also had been struggling, so not a competitive car uh, for um, Mario Andretti. So he left after 81, officially, only to return for two races in 1982 at the end of the reason, uh, of the season. Not for, uh, not for nice uh, uh, reasons, uh, because it was a very uh, dark year for the uh, Ferrari team. First, they lost uh, Gil Veneuve in Solda in a fatal accident. Later, uh, the second driver, Didier Pironi, had a very strong accident where he broke all his, uh, all his legs, I mean, his two legs. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was the end of his uh, Formula uh, career. One career. He returned to later to... Uh, a motorboat, speedboat racing, where he then had his uh, fatal accident uh, tragically. So first of all, uh, um, Ferrari uh, uh, asked uh, Patrick També to replace uh, Jill Veneuve. And then after the accident of Didi Pironi, um, they asked uh, Mario Andretti to temporarily uh, drive the Ferrari. Temporary because Mario Andretti at that time, if I'm correct, had been 42 years old. Also, uh, he, he wasn't uh, the first uh, option. They tried first to call the uh, last year's champion, Alan Jones, who retired uh, after that season from Williams. But Alan Jones wasn't sure what he wanted at that time, return or not return. So he declined the offer from Ferrari. Second on the telephone list, Mario Andretti. And uh, practically Andretti said uh, later, when Enzo Ferrari calls, uh, you have to come. Uh, <laughs> you have to go. <laughs> you have to go. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, e e e even stronger, of course, if you have uh, Italian uh, heritage, I assume. Yeah, but I also want to say, we, you mentioned this, and uh, this is an important point. So really, after Ronnie Peterson's death, I think uh, he kind of made up you know, his mind that he wasn't going to... Yes continue at least uh, with uh, it was obvious at, with lotus right but generally i think it really affected him even though he yeah. was you know competing also in other racing uh, championships uh, apart from formula one uh after 1981 uh, but you know i think yeah it definitely had an effect yes on him yes we can uh, of course assume this very strong Okay, so this is Mario Andretti in Formula One. Let's uh, see what uh, he was uh, driving starting in 1968, last race in 1982, so a very long career in uh, Formula One. Of course, uh, most famous uh, with Lotus, with, uh, uh, including the famous uh, black and gold uh, livery, first with John Player uh, Special, and then... Uh, they replaced it uh, with uh, the Japanese uh, camera company Olympus, which has luckily the same color, so very iconic. Not only the Lotus it itself, Andretti, the driver, but also the li library, everything somehow coming together. Mm -hmm. And no. uh, by the way, uh, sorry, I, I forgot to mention, uh, Mario Andretti, of course, was celebrated uh, in 82, driving for Ferrari by the Tifosi, not only for marketing, but it was also uh, very important for Ferrari uh, to uh, ensure the constructors championship uh, because Andretti, in the first race, uh, he had technical problems, but in the second race, he came in in a fantastic third position. I mean, he came out of retirement, didn't know the car, 
third position in Monza. Of course, he was celebrated uh, by the Tifosi there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to say that again, even within Formula One, there is there was quite a considerable heterogeneity of makes that yeah. he that that he was driving uh, apart from Lotus, March, Pernelli, and Alfa Romeo, Ferrari, Williams. Yeah. So quite a quite a wide range of, of cars. That's right. And this shows, I mean, the men not only have been flexible driving in different uh, series, but also inside Formula One. Uh, in complete different uh, teams, complete different uh, technical approaches, working cultures, etc. Mm -hmm. Even longer than in uh, Formula One, he had been active in the American Cup Series here starting in 1979 and have been active in 1994. Uh, 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 quite curious effect, uh, even if he was uh, always very competitive here, he only won the championship uh, once uh, with the 84 uh, Loda T900, which you can see uh, the car of the Newman Haas racing team. So the same Haas team, which is uh, nowadays also active in Formula One. Yeah. And Newman and, uh... is... Uh, and I, have, I just wanted to say that this uh, championship is a, a sort of a, a favorite was was favorite in the nineties of of my mom, and I remember that Mario Andretti was also her favorite driver. So so very special episode for her today. Yeah, uh, a, I mean, uh, I I wanted to uh, tell a similar uh, uh, regarding Mario Andretti. I, I think. Uh, Somehow, uh, not only because he's uh, such a successful uh, driver in all series, but also based on his uh, character, a very nice person, uh, very good with the media, uh, very likable, very positive, uh, also very knowledgeable when he's speaking. Uh, he also got a, uh, a nice place in uh, pop culture so let's say if you uh, for example if you see somebody speeding on the street you say he's driving like uh, mario andretti and uh, many uh, people who have no clue about motorsports at all uh, know mario andretti uh, for example uh, similar as you just uh, said i remember my grandmother the only formula one driver for whatever reason uh, she had known was uh, at least his name was mario andretti yeah, I mean, I would say that probably now people know more, you know, like Lewis Hamilton and maybe Schumacher, uh, Michael Schumacher mm -hmm. still, I think many people know, maybe not so much Mario Andretti, but definitely in the 90s, this was the household name, that's for sure. <laughs> that's that's yeah. right. right uh... Yeah, and multiple wins in different events. Um, you know, so uh... exactly. No, normally, when you speak in the, the triple crown in uh, motorsports, you mean uh, uh, from uh, Monaco, uh, uh, you mean uh, Formula One, you mean Indianapolis, and you mean uh, Le Mans. Um, he won another kind of uh, triple crown. He won. Uh, he won the championship. Um, Indianapolis. He won Indianapolis 500. He won. Uh, Formula One championship, he won Daytona, the Daytona 500. Uh, he never won the overall class uh, in the 24 Le hours of Le Mans. Uh, he won uh, Le Mans in the uh, in the um, because he was uh, second overall. He won the particular uh, was it uh, the second um, uh, second class. Uh, for the, a little bit smaller cars with the Courage, Courage sorry, C34 Porsche. So he, he won uh, Le Mans, but let's say not the overall uh, classification, which mm -hmm. had been not including the prototypes, which have been much faster than this uh, smaller Courage. Quotes. All right. Now let's you as I mentioned, um, very good with the media, always a lot uh, to say. So we have a, a nice collection of quotes. 
Let's start. If everything seems under control, you are just not going fast enough. Uh, for me, maybe his most famous uh, quote, I use it sometimes, for example, uh, speaking about uh, business controls, uh, as uh, you want to say, if uh, not everything is under control, you're definitely going too fast. So uh, switched it around a little bit. Mm -hmm. Kind of also reminds me uh, James Hunt, right? Uh, kind of similar sort of attitude there, in, uh, yeah. at least on this quote. Yeah. Right. Second, uh, desire is the key to motivation, but it's determination and commitment to an unrelenting pursuit of your goal, a commitment to excellence that will enable you to attain the success you seek. And of course, yeah. something not only true for motorsports, but you can use it also as a general motivational quote. Yeah, and um, you know, the, the, this also kind of quite a few people I think took it on board. Like uh, there is this famous quote from James Cameron about uh, the Avatar, the first Avatar movie, when he said that if you set your goals uh, uh, incredibly high and it's a failure, you know, you can fail beyond every, everybody's success. So it's yeah. kind of similar, right? So if you really strive right. for the best, uh, even if you fail, it kind of looks good. <laughs> exactly. So, so um, yeah. Um, yeah, and then the next quote kind of also is uh, in vain with the previous one. If you are so afraid of failure, you will never succeed. You have to take the chances. And you know this, I just want to mention this. There is this... Uh, new film with Adam Sandler on about motivation and basketball. Um, and um, in that film, it's kind of very similar. So like so someone is that's basically about a, a basketball player who was very affected by what the, uh, you know, the opponents would tell him, like they would say something personal and uh, he would lose motivation to play. But he was kind of a really good, good, uh, good basketball player. And then the whole film is about how, you know, coach is trying to help him out of the situation. But that's kind of like this, right? So if you think that, you know, someone will say something to you and it's going to affect you, then you will never succeed. You need to learn how to, you know, how to control yourself. And uh, this is really um, also great advice, great motivational advice. Yeah. Next, next one, next series. Whenever you are aggressive, you are at the edge of mistakes. So, and I mean, you, uh, you see this very often, motorsports, sports in general, business, where, when, when you really get emotional, especially aggressive, then uh, you lose a little bit the ability for logical thinking and you make subconsciously mistakes. So, Try to be relaxed, keep uh, emotion out uh, as far as you can, and normally uh, this will bring uh, deliver you better results. Do it no matter what. If you believe in it, it is something very honorable. If somebody around you or your family does not understand it, then that's their problem. But if you do have a passion, an honest passion, just do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. Ne never, 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 never give up. <laughs> exactly. Follow your dream. Don't give up. Yeah. Nothing to add uh, to that, of course. I mean, uh, the next uh, quote kind of reminds me of Ayrton Senna, who also thought that nothing can yes. happen to him inside the racing car. Um, yeah. If you're safer, uh, so basically what, what he says is, you're safer in the race car than you are in cars going to and from the track. So, yeah. um, I mean, I'm not sure that's entirely correct, but it kind of also shows you that, uh, you know, we've done quite a lot of research with racing drivers and um, uh, we uh, measure the risk attitudes and they do not perceive uh, uh, the racing, uh, yeah, the circuit driving, uh, the racing driving as uh, risky, as something risky. Yeah. It's their job, right? And that's basically yeah. what, what it is. He's just basically saying, well, you know, I'm just doing my job and it's the same job as, I don't know, Amazon delivery guy, right? Uh, so except, uh, 
I'm at high speeds and probably people around me can drive, you know, really can drive. Uh, yeah. Whereas like an uh, Amazon problem. delivery guy probably drives around people that are unpredictable and, uh, right. you know, the chances are that you can kind of have a nasty accident in both cases, but exactly, maybe, yeah. maybe in the Amazon. second case it's higher. Yeah. yeah. Uh, up to that the Amazon guys uh, also face big uh, dangerous dogs and other as a situation, yeah, of course, it's also psychologically, uh, you mm -hmm. can explain it. Uh, I mean, if you, because you want to shut off uh, the perceived uh, danger, so it's a typical human um, uh, behavior also to reduce a little bit the risk and uh, same as you do with, for example, with uh, smoking, uh, drinking or any other kind of uh, drugs. Okay, next one. Having uh, said that, let's also having said that, let's yeah. just say that we do not we are completely against smoking, drinking and, <laughs> and any kind of drugs. <laughs> just uh, exactly. just, in, just in case uh, someone is not clear about that, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean I mean the other way around. Uh, that's why you can explain why people not uh, are logically thinking about uh, the risks of smoking and continue smoking. Yeah, yeah, even, of course. Yeah. I mean uh, they theoretically know that they shouldn't do, but let's say they, their heart uh, tells them differently, and of course the addiction uh, too. A racing car is an animal with a thousand adjustments. That's why a com car is a very complex machine, and a lot of things you can change. Uh, so, I mean, yeah. and, um, it was yeah. too. True in the 80s, I mean, even more true with uh, today, as you have so many possibilities, including changing sensors, computers, blah, blah, blah. So very difficult uh, to have the perfect setup of a car because there's so many things which you can change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, the next one is I've always, this is the one that I was talking about. Yeah. I've always said I didn't have a plan B in life. Uh, I was in pursuit of my dream from the very beginning. It's all about desire and passion at all costs. And um, yeah, I also want to mention here that, um, uh, you know, I read uh, when I read about, you know, when when um, Mario Andretti's uh, brother Aldo passed away, um, he was also saying in some interviews that uh, Aldo and I, we had the same dream. So this is why, you know, uh, his uh, his twin brother always came like he was his b biggest fan. So always came to support, support his brother. And uh, that also kind of gives you sort of this additional strength when you go into the uh, you go into the race. Yeah. Yep. Uh, from there, what I learned is that in business, you must make decisions based on facts not react with your heart. So uh, it's yeah. a little bit what, what we just uh, discussed. And maybe here uh, you see motorsports uh, also similar to an uh, addiction because it's not really a logical this decision to bring yourself into a dangerous situation just to be the first after two hours or whatever. And yeah. uh, Mario Andretti, not only is a driver, uh, but you will see also his businessman has has a company here in the US. Also, uh, I mean, he is the uh, he's, I mean, the racing team is now part of his uh, son, but uh, I mean, he's also involved. He has uh, various uh, kart uh, places here in the US, so he's also business person. Uh, absolutely, and um, I just want to say that this last quote. Uh... Uh, is something that you can imagine Nikki Lauda could say, right? But I think uh, <laughs> um, in terms of, yeah, in terms of like what it is, uh, um, it's uh, it's also, I think, uh, quite um, an interesting, uh, it, so an, 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 an interesting dichotomy between, uh, so the way, you know, we usually imagine stereotypical, sort of Italian businessman who yeah, you imagine are quite emotional. And yet in yeah. racing, we have very successful Italian managers and you yeah. know team principals and uh, businessmen present. And that kind of tells you that, you know, they really do understand not only how to be passionate about something, but also how to take it with uh, sort of uh, 
um, uh, you know, kind of with a healthy degree of uh, of, of of skepticism and uh, to be really very rational about what is happening around you. Yeah. I lived the true American dream because I was able to pursue what I set as my goals at a very young age. And I think not much uh, to add. I mean, not only the American dream, also, I mean, uh, maybe uh, his parents, they're not directly, uh, directly uh, lived the American dream, but they got uh, decent uh, jobs, which was uh, important for them, as uh, we uh, outlined, they became as uh, with immigrants with practically no money at all. Yeah, but I think here he suggests that he was lucky. And, uh, you know, we always have this, uh, kind of, you know, sort of uh, discussions about skill versus luck and what is more yeah. important. But I think, you know, it's um, um, it's actually like you, um, yeah, you can be, you cannot be lucky without applying a lot of work, right? So I think you put in a lot of work into being lucky, yeah. Into being in the in the right place at the right time, and kind of the yeah. second the second quote uh, here also says that uh, he wasn't lucky all the time, at least uh, yeah. not when Ferrari was making choices right about drivers. Exactly. So uh, the mentioned quote: uh, "It seemed like whenever I got a bona fide offer from Ferrari, I couldn't do it, and vice versa. When I was ready, their seats were taken." We always had a relationship, but what's important is that I pretty much started my Formula One career with them and ended it there too. So things could have done uh, better if it would have worked out, but at, at the end, uh, I think he was happy the way it went for him in Formula One. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I don't remember as a kid wanting to do or be anything else but drive something, be a race driver. Same what we already discussed, no plan B, but he really followed uh, his dream and luckily uh, made it. It is amazing how many drivers, even at Formula One level, think that the brakes are for slowing the car down and... Uh, uh, Yes, so he had a very good understanding that uh, fast braking, efficient braking also is a competitive advantage against other Formula One drivers. Mm -hmm. So it's not just standing all the time on the uh, gas uh, pedal. Mm -hmm. If you don't come walking back to the pits every once in a while holding a steering wheel in your hands, you're not trying hard enough. Meaning, uh, that failure and, uh, teaches so, you, yeah. Exactly. If you fail, failure, it teaches teaches you. You. <laughs> yeah. failure teaches you. Failure teaches you if you want to see it, let's say, as a motivational quote, uh, using also for your personal life. Uh, maybe uh, for him, especially in Formula uh, One, uh, means that inside the, for example, the free practice sessions, you have to. Uh, really find out where are the limits and if you're in the process finding out where the limits are really are uh, you may also overstep uh, this limit causing an accident coming home with the steering wheel the crashes people remember but drivers remember the near misses yeah, I'm sure they do, as probably all people, right? <laughs> right, and, and of course, uh, he may also uh, relate this uh, to the fatal accident, as uh, people remember the, where people, drivers died, but of course, uh, the, the driver itself, uh, not anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, what we already discussed, uh, Colin Chapman, uh, uh, owner of Lotus uh, told me I want to make cars lighter and lighter. Then I replied, then the two of us have to clarify amongst ourselves because I want to live as long as possible. Yeah, so Such he was realizing that it wasn't cars. very safe. Right. <laughs> in, in a very light car. Exactly. Driving a turbo Formula One cars of many years ago was like to be sitting on a crate of dynamite. 
Which is probably true. <laughs> yep. Um, Last but not uh, least, uh, the ground effect cars were getting absorbed, really crude, with no suspension movement, whatever. It was toggle switch driving with no need of any kind of delicacy. It made leaving Formula One a lot easier than it would have been. Yeah. So, so uh, what, what we discussed, uh, ground effect cars, they are great when you are dry, driving normally, but if you have some, let's say something breaks at your car, uh, you leave uh, or you break too late, you leave the track, then this car gets completely non-predictable. And as Mario said, he wanted to live as long as possible. Uh, uh, he understood that these cars really became too dangerous. Yeah, and uh, well, not only drive, uh, um, you know, drive at a normal speed, but also in a straight line, I have to say, yes. because every time you're not driving in a straight line, that becomes a problem, yeah. Yep. Yeah, legacy. legacy. And here we see three generations of um, Andretti's family. So we see uh, Michael, so his son, on the left hand side, if you're watching us uh, on YouTube, and Marco, right uh, on the right hand side, uh, his uh, grandson. Right, and, Michael, and they're all uh, racing drivers. They're all racing drivers. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I, I mean, uh, he's in, uh, a lot of more Andretti family members. Other uh, Michael, uh, you may remember, also has been one year in Formula One. Uh, maybe not uh, the most uh, uh, lucky year in his life. He was came as reigning IndyCar champion into the McLaren team besides Ayrton Senna and uh, didn't look too good besides Ayrton Senna. So maybe not a, a good decision he took at that time, but an experience. <laughs> yeah, but nevertheless, very successful in um, you yes. know in other types Correct. of racing. Yeah, and, uh, and currently has ambitions to go into Formula One, as we will see. Uh, yeah, I just also yeah. want to mention, since we, I just want to reiterate that um, that Mario Andretti was very close with his brother Aldo, who passed away at the age of 80, uh, and Mario Andretti himself is now 80, 82, sorry, 82. And um, yeah, so we hope that... Uh, he will continue being in good health and everything. He will long, uh, live very, very long life. <clears throat> yeah. Nothing to add to this. And uh, Michael Andretti, uh, sorry, Mario Andretti, uh, really uh, a family person. So the, let's say the typical cliche uh, of big uh, and close uh, Italian uh, families. Uh, in this case, I, I would assume uh, even stronger as they came as immigrants uh, uh, coming in a very hard situation to the countries, which uh, makes you grow together uh, even more. Uh, so he also uh, had the opportunity to drive together with his uh, son, uh, Michael, uh, and his other son, uh, Jeff uh, Andretti, driving uh, the uh, Porsche 962, as you can see it. Uh, here on the right, uh, driving this car at uh, the uh, 24 hours uh, of Daytona Beach in uh, down in uh, Florida. Yeah, and, and like I said before, Mario is also his, uh, uh, his grandson, so he's also a, uh, yeah. a racing driver, <clears throat> drives and again in a, in a variety yeah. of... Uh, um events and uh, even you know managed to finish second in the, in in Indy, uh, in 2006 and uh, yeah so uh, got rookie of the year award but as far as i remember michael also at one point got rookie of the year award if i'm maybe i'm mixing things up so tell us if i do <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it's quite a, you know, so definitely, you know, Mario got, got the award. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I was uh, somehow sure Michael also had that award. I, I, don't, I don't know, but Michael was very successful in IndyCar. Um, <clears throat> yeah, as you will see on this slide, yeah. uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, <laughs> yeah, that uh, seems to suggest that he was uh, 
um, you know, he had uh, 40, so, so when we talk about just IndyCar, uh, so Mario Andretti is the second uh, all-time IndyCar, uh, he has a second all-time IndyCar record, like I said, I think, I think I'm right uh, that the first one is AJ Foyt, um, who is a very, very cool American driver, like a legendary guy. Uh, and uh, Michael Andretti had uh, 42 wins um, and, uh, you know, so he he was, uh, I think, was very successful in Indy. And um, yeah, so so I think uh, we will see probably more of Marco's performance. So, so in uh, in 2020, he was uh, sort of he was on pole at one point, and uh, but you know the season didn't go too well for him. But uh, you know, very competitive, very competitive as a family. <laughs> let's just say it's always a combination driver, uh, team, uh, technology. So you have to be. Uh, at the right time, at, uh, at the right uh, place. As also Mario has said in one uh, of his quotes related to uh, Ferrari, and why he not spend more time at uh, Ferrari in Formula One. Yeah. Okay, uh, if you are more interested about all sides, uh, about uh, Mario Andretti, go to his uh, website, please, marioandretti.com. As we mentioned, uh, he's also active uh, himself on Twitter, maybe also on Instagram. On Inst I'm not sure about Instagram, but I know on Twitter, yes, uh, he is. Uh, here you learn about uh, his career, uh, history, uh, also other uh, business activities. Uh, for example, he also has uh, his own uh, wine, I think, in uh, California. So he is also active in, in the wine uh, production. So really, uh, not only driver, but also a businessman and uh, enjoying life. I mean, he's practically, you always seem very positive, smiling. Uh, so a very uh, optimist uh, person. The, the, the thing what we uh, discussed a little bit earlier on, uh, I think you also had a, a big impact on uh, pop culture. So if you uh, in the 1980s uh, thought about a racing driver, uh, it was Mario Andretti. If you are in the traffic, say, seeing somebody crazily speeding, you say he's driving like Mario Andretti. For this, for example, also mentioned in the... Um, uh, in this song from 1991 by Amy Grant, who mostly did uh, Christian music, but in the beginning of the 90s, I think did one uh, uh, normal pop uh, album, which was quite successful at that time. As always, uh, uh, when we mention music, uh, we cannot uh, play it to, uh, uh, to regulations, of course, here in Spotify, uh, sorry, in YouTube, but we have... Uh, data-driven F1 mixtape on Spotify, so you can listen to all the different songs related to Formula One uh, there. Yes, and, and so, yeah, so this is an emigrant uh, song, uh, Good For Me, uh, from 1991, and uh, you, you have uh, 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 like an extract about yeah. uh, uh, Mario Andretti in the, in the text of the song. So, um, yeah. You can yeah. definitely in enjoy the song if you uh, uh, get to uh, uh, license distributor <laughs> of music. <laughs> yeah, to, to be honest, I think uh, you can also listen to it if you're having the free version of Spotify. Mm -hmm. I'm, as far as I understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's what, what you somewhere uh, already mentioned. Uh, Mario Andretti uh, together with Andretti Motorsports, and I think the CEO is uh, his son Michael, Michael. Uh, Andretti. But and Mario Andretti is uh, heavily involved. They have the plan to be part of the 2024 Formula One season. Yeah, uh, I know. I, uh, yeah. yeah, I know that they uh, they have a sort of expressed uh, frustration at how difficult it is to enter at this stage uh, because uh, they've been kind of greeted with a lot of uh, um, 
sort of resistance, uh, let's just say. Um, uh, so essentially, yeah, there is a lot of resistance for them to enter and it's been very, very slow process. I know that yeah. they also were trying to, um, at one point, to, to buy Sauber, or at least they, they had a bid no. to buy Sauber. No, I think it was Haas. Was it? Uh, uh, I thought it was Sauber. But so, yeah, maybe improvement if, if I'm wrong. I think both, both but uh, Sauber, uh, I mean, will have the cooperation with Audi, so will mm. be practically out of reach. And I think they also spoke uh, spoke with uh, Haas, as Haas, uh, let's yeah, say, is also so. struggling with, with budget, but Haas declined the offer. So to be honest, it doesn't look very good uh, that uh, we will see Andretti, uh, on the other hand, I mean, if you ask all Formula One fans, I think everybody uh, would love to see an Andretti Formula One team inside the sport. Yeah, but a sort of the, I mean, the resistance, I think, comes from uh, sort of the management, uh, well, yes. the FIA and yes. uh, the other teams uh, who basically say, well, that's, you know, we have enough kind of contenders. But at the same time, it kind of makes you wonder. So they, a few years back, remember, they had this uh, uh, pathetic excuse for a team from Russia called Marasha, which yeah. is uh, like really horrible thing, but they let it happen. And yeah, then yeah. why not uh, let Andretti family enter? You know, I don't understand. Exactly. Exactly. As I said, I think, I mean, uh, uh, every Formula One fan uh, would love uh, to see this uh, because mm -hmm. uh, he's such a beloved uh, person. Uh, he's one of the greatest drivers uh, of all times, if you consider he's been successful in so many series. So uh, I think we all would love to see this team. So uh, we still have not given up uh, our hopes uh, to see it in 2024. So yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Formula One activists out there, you know what to fight for. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and on that happy note, <laughs> yeah, and on that happy note, uh, yeah, we just want to remind you that, uh, of course, our video version is on uh, uh, on YouTube and Spotify. And thanks to Patrick, we are also present on uh, a growing number of uh, podcasting platforms. Uh, so. Uh, do check out uh, different episodes, so not only this one, but like we said before, we have uh, specials on uh, Colin Chapman, uh, you know, we, we talked a lot about Ferrari team, so you kind of can find uh, quite a lot of information uh, on um, uh, either in the podcast series or in the video series, and uh, we hope to see you soon. Yep. Thank you. And Bye. Thank See you, you and bye -bye. until the next time. Bye-bye.